I am uh, going to take a moment to uh, uh, go over the GoToWebinar technology. Right now, you should see the control panel pictured on your screen. Uh, if you do not, it may be uh, minimized, and you can pull it out by going to the Grab tab, which is item D um, shown here. It hides and shows the control panel. There is also an attendee list, item A, where you can see all of the participants on the call. And uh, we will be uh, having time for question and discussion. So to submit any questions or comments, you can type your question into the question pane, and I can uh, read it to the group uh, or respond privately. All of the panes can be expanded or minimized by clicking on the plus or minus button that are at the top left of each pane. And in the past, we've had some audio trouble. And if for any reason you're experiencing any difficulty hearing, you may uh, just want to ensure that you're not muted on your personal phone and that you've entered the audio pin provided to you at the beginning of the call. Um, if that doesn't work, you can always hang up and call back in and be sure to enter the audio pin. So again, welcome to today's Achieving the Dream Technology Solutions webinar. This webinar will be recorded and will be available to you on our YouTube channel as well as on the Achieving the Dream website. I am Caitlin Donnelly. I am the Strategic Partnerships and Development Officer here. And so for today's agenda, I'll share a little bit about the Technology Solutions webinar series. I'll introduce you to our panelists. Uh, and then we will go into the presentation, When Legislation Changes the Game, the new playbook for responding to remedial needs. And then we will, of course, have time for a question and answer and a, a little bit of discussion. So the Technology Solutions webinar series. Achieving the Dream understands that increasingly often the solutions that our network colleges are adopting improve student persistence, completion, and the attainment of market value credentials involve the use of technology. This webinar series for our network colleges is, in, is intended to provide information about technology solutions that Achieving the Dream colleges have found very successful in improving student success outcomes. The series gives us all an opportunity to stay abreast of the rapidly changing education technology environment by hearing stories from our colleges about what is working for them and the impact the technology has had on their ability to collect and use data to bring about institutional change. So today our panelists from St. Petersburg College, which is an Achieving the Dream Leader College, we have Dr. Jesse Caraggio. He's the Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness and Academic Services. And we also have Joe Leopold. He's the Director of Learning Resources at St. Petersburg College. And they are joined by Dr. Krista Amon Powers. She's the Vice President and Chief Education Officer for Smart Thinking at Pearson. And now I will turn it over to Jesse to begin the presentation. Good afternoon from the East Coast. Um, so we're going to present a little bit of information about uh, one of the changes that happened, really became affected in January 2014, when the, Florida, the state of Florida enacted Senate Bill 1720, uh, which really provided different options for students as they approach um, entering uh, schools and how it was impactful for college readiness. So let's go on to the next slide. I'm going to start real quickly just by just giving you some context of the St. Petersburg College. Um, we have uh, seven major learning sites. You can see our fall enrollment. Uh, it's just under 33,000 students. Uh, we're under 275,000 SSH. Uh, you can see the number of degrees and certificates, almost 7,000 for the 14-15 academic year. And in terms of full-time faculty, we have just under 400. Next slide, please. Um, before we really get into some of the details associated with Senate Bill 1720, uh, I wanted to kind of give a perspective on some of the work we did prior to, um, because 
I think we were able to accomplish a lot in a very short period of time in making sure we're focusing on, on helping our students as the legislation became enacted. Um, but, but as a, a result, a lot of it had to do with some of the prior work that we did that really meshed with our ability to be so nimble. Uh, and some of that started with the dev ed reform that we actually started in fall 2011. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from, from the state uh, that provided us with some resources uh, to begin to create modularized versions of our remedial or developmental education courses. So in the areas of reading, writing, and math, we actually began to go down that road uh, and create modules of courses to enable students to get the same level of content but a much shorter period of time. And you can see from the core success rates, this is the percentage of A, Bs, and Cs, uh, that we did have some success with those results and students were being able to perform better taking these more modular design courses. Next slide, please. The other important aspect is uh, our student support system. Uh, we have something we call the college experience that we really started to work on also around the 2011 time period uh, that basically is the integration of five of the high impact practices. In fact, all five are listed out of the 13 that SESI put forward. Uh, and this is a joint project that's under the, the guidance of our, our campus provost or, or, or our campus presidents uh, as they provide a support system or a safety net for all students. And this especially impacts the, those students that, are, um, that are, aren't the level of college readiness. Um, those are the five elements, a, a strong focus on new student orientation. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, that every student has a learning plan to help give them a pathway through the curriculum. Uh, that we have early alert system uh, specifically targeted on our gateway courses and our developmental courses. Uh, that we really make uh, career readiness an aspect throughout the entire program, not necessarily just at the end, but also in the beginning. Uh, and that we really focus on learning support. We'll talk a lot in detail about learning support in a little while. But focus in the context that it's not really punitive. I mean, you don't go to tutor and you get in trouble. Uh, the idea before, uh, behind our philosophy of learning support is it's really supplemental and it's part of the educational process all along and we get students engaged from, from day one when they walk on campus. Next slide, please. There's also a strong um, a culture component uh, that's really, we could talk in a lot more detail in another webinar, um, but the focus is on us building the culture and how we use and consume data and use that data to drive change. And this, this also speaks to the ability for us to be very nimble in some of the changes we made. Uh, a good example of that and, and really a good example of data-informed decision-making is our Wednesday webinar. Um, so we have a few of these webinars, but, but this is probably the one that's the most robust that we've had in the longest amount of time. And what we do is we have frontline staff report in the different areas in those five elements of the college experience. Uh, and they literally do this every Wednesday morning on a half hour call. And it's a report out call, but to provide insight on what's going on in these different areas. And you can see out of classroom support is included as part of that list. Uh, this is facilitated by the president. We often have 150 to 200 people on the call every Wednesday. In fact, uh, we just had one that we did this morning. We'll talk as we go throughout this presentation about some of the values of that culture. So that takes us to Senate Bill 1720, which really is our topic of our discussion. These are the specific elements of Senate Bill 1720. So what it essentially did is it created a new category for students, and you can see the criteria there. Uh, those who are ninth grade and in the 3-4 school year, uh, who earned a standard high school diploma or were active military, now had options. Uh, they weren't mandated to do the things that were required before. They weren't mandated to take a college placement test. They were not mandated any longer to participate in remedial education based on those results. Um, so what happened, uh, this was really a, a 11th hour uh, legislative change uh, where we had uh, between our Senate and our House, our Senate wanted to essentially abolish remedial education, make students take a test, and if they didn't score high enough, they had to go back to adult education. On the House side, you had more folks that wanted to continue with some of the reforms that were already in place. And at the end of the day, we ended up with a compromise that I don't know that anybody was entirely positive about at the end of the day. Um, but, but at the same time, there are students, and we had to figure out how to react. And you, we'll talk a little while how we try to react as, as quick as possible. Next slide, please. So we had to put a plan together. And the, and, and the legislation. It, it was July, thir uh, July uh, uh, 1st, uh, 2013. Uh, that was the date that it became enacted. It became effective for students the following January, January 14th. 
Um, but, th but the actual states weren't required to have their remedial developmental plans in place to support these students until the following fall. So we're talking August of 2014. We didn't want to wait that long. You know, we were uncomfortable with that idea because we knew that we had students coming up that very October who by the following January were now going to have the ability to make choices about their educational process. And we wanted to build a system to give them as much information as possible. So our plan was predicated on education. We wanted to make sure everybody, uh, internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, had a good understanding of what this developmental education reform was about from the legislative standpoint, as well as from our college, how we were approaching it. We wanted to streamline everything. So we spent a lot of energy in the area of um, uh, how we were electronically receiving transcripts in an EDI process. And rather than just capturing the, 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 the GPA collaborative kinds of information, uh, we actually started to collect uh, individual course level information on students. Uh, and we wanted a, a broader view. We no longer had the placement test. So we no longer had the one measure. Uh, we knew that wasn't the best design. We knew we needed multiple measures. And as a result, we created a prediction model uh, that looked at students past high school performance. So we looked at things such as enrollment in specific classes. We look at discipline specific GPAs. Uh, and we took that information and pulled it together to place them in a, in a specific college readiness category that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So this was our plan. Uh, from, the, from the very beginning, we had strong leadership for, for support because the idea was that we weren't going to create the plan in four months. We were actually going to implement the plan in four months. So we wanted this plan implemented in October where our students began to register for the following spring semester where they now had choices. Uh, so we had good leadership support at the top. Uh, we created an oversight group that was multi-level. You can see our, our collaborative lab record there uh, where we actually pulled folks in from all levels of the organization. We had academic, we had student support, student affairs, all in the room with our technology folks, our institutional research folks in the room discussing how best to put a plan together. We created a dev ed committee. We engaged frontline staff. That's one of our key values here. Uh, some of the values include collaboration, transparency, uh, and, and that, that involving all levels of the organization. And you'll see, we'll talk, look at some screenshots. Our frontline staff actually developed those screenshots. Um, we had regular updates to the board. We wanted to be completely transparent about what we did. Uh, we were very careful about the terminology. We, we didn't want to use the statute language. We wanted to use language that students could understand. Uh, we talked a little about technology. Uh, and we wanted to implement it as soon as we can, as soon as it was going to impact students and monitor the results. Next slide, please. So uh, two big aspects of the plan we'll talk about in these next couple of slides are training and communication. Uh, from the training standpoint, uh, we had a separate track of training for our faculty and a separate track of training for our advising staff. Um, they, the common element to the training was the first part, which is a general uh, overview of developmental education reform at St. Petersburg College. We actually did a video, and we'll provide everybody a link to that video, in which our two senior vice presidents of academic affairs and student affairs jointly did a presentation about the importance of the legislation and how it impacts students and what we needed to do as an institution to respond. On the faculty side, we begin to create um, uh, information that we could use in our gateway courses for our instructors to help them explain what a, a developmental education student looks like and how they react to information. Because many of our gateway uh, faculty had never worked with directly with developmental education students. And now we had students that, you know, the breadth of ability, the distribution ability dramatically changes now in the classroom. Where it was only students that passed at a certain level of a test before, now it's been expanded to all students of all ability levels because they have choices to go right into gateway coursework. And on the advisor side, we had to completely change the model. We'll talk in a little while about how we had two different groups now. We had our traditional group, and we had a flexible group. Uh, and they had different options. So advising staff had to completely change their model, address students in the front end, find out which group they belong to. Uh, and to help this, we actually did, uh, in the last, different, last training year, some role playing so they could go through the process and be comfortable with it. Next slide, please. So the second element was communications, and we were completely transparent about this. We were transparent with our board. We were transparent with our current students. Because keep in mind now, you had students that were actually in developmental education who now heard about this legislation, could drop out of that class and the next semester move right into uh, gateway coursework. Or who could have previously done poorly on a placement test that now automatically. Or we even communicated with previous students who may have dropped out because they were unsuccessful working on their developmental education courses. 
So we were completely transparent, wanted to let everybody know what the information was. Next slide, please. So these are the two tracks. I mentioned a lot about the language, and, and, and that's really key to us. We wanted to make sure it was student-friendly language as we shared the model. Uh, we, the, the statute actually refers to an exempt student and a non-exempt student. So the exempt student could choose to, to opt out of developmental education. Uh, but students weren't going to know what that meant, and, 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 it, and the word has some negative connotations to it. So we were defining these as flexible placement, those students who no longer had the requirement. We wanted to educate those students. We'll show in a little while some of the information we shared with them to help them make an informed decision. And then we had the traditional placement students that didn't fall with that in that exemption criteria who now still had to take a placement step, test and still had to go through the standard rigor of the, of the college readiness on the front end. Next slide, please. So uh, here's some more of the language. Uh, what this chart shows is options for students as they're presented. So this specifically looks at the math discipline. Uh, but you can see we had three levels of college readiness. If you look to the left side of the screen, I'll start at the bottom. We had likely college ready, DevEd recommended, and then for those students in extreme cases, DevEd strongly recommended. So our prediction model based on the former high school experience produced these three classification levels in each of the three areas, math, reading, and writing. And you can see we provided options. Uh, we created new options as a result. In fact, there's a lot of options that were created in the state of Florida where we've done things to put level one and level two remediation together, or uh, level two reading and level two writing together, or created co-requisites that were a remedial co-requisite that went along with the gateway course. Uh, and these are just some of the options you see here. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to make sure our students were informed and had all the possible information. So we gave them sample problems. We created. We weren't permitted to test them uh, based on the advice of, of our, our, our State Department. Um, but we wanted to give them information to help them make the proper decision. So we created low-stakes tests that didn't capture identifiable student information they could take on their own. We provided our advisor sample items and let them tell the students, this is the information you would expect it to be know in the first day of class. Not at the end of the class, but the day you walk in. And have them have that information so they could make an informed decision. Next slide, please. We also provided the quantifiable data. So this is the results of spring that we actually hand, advisors hand out to students and said, students who we recommend take developmental education in the area of math when they go right into a gateway math course. And an example here is the intermediate algebra. Only two of those 10 students are going to pass with a C or better. And the areas of reading and writing, we talk about ENC 1101, it's a little bit higher, but it's still only five out of 10 students that are going to be successful. Next slide. These are a couple of the screenshots. As I mentioned before, we had frontline staff that really worked with us and designed the look and feel. You know, it wasn't administrators designing this page. It wasn't IT staff. It was frontline staff. And we use this information to inform the student Based on the prediction model results, this is where they, they fare. And the second slide is to really give them information on their choices. So we show them what we recommend, and then they have the option of accepting the recommendation or declining the recommendation. Uh, but this really provides them with a sense of ownership. So we've done our best part to inform them about their choices, inform them of their status and behaviors, and then provide them at the very end here the option to acknowledge that decision or make another decision. Next slide, please. Uh, we did MOOCs. That's another tool we've used. Uh, we've actually been doing MOOCs. We released our first MOOC, College Readiness MOOC, in May 8th of 2013. Uh, in the mathematics area, we've since created reading, writing, and statistics MOOCs. But we've had over 10,000 students use them, and they truly are free. They are massive open online courses. They're free to anybody to take. And in fact, we have a large percentage of students in the, in the uh, local school districts that are participating. Next slide. And another thing that we did, um, and we've had in place about a year, is we created another math pathway. Uh, traditionally, in the state of Florida, MA 1033 was really the pathway through intermediate algebra on the, on the calculus. But for many programs, they didn't have that calculus requirement. Uh, and that often became a real barrier for students as they progressed through the curriculum. So what we did it was we created an alternative pathway, MAT 1100, Exploration of Mathematics and Quantitative Reasoning. And the intent of this is for programs that didn't have the calculus requirement, such as areas of health science, some areas of education, or public safety. And they could take a course that would then be a prerequisite on either statistics or one of the liberal arts math. Now I'd like to turn it over to Joe Leopold to tell us a little bit about the, um, the virtual learning. Program. Great. Joe? Great. Yeah. 
So in anticipation of the students uh, who were formerly DevEd uh, opting out for flexible placement, we knew that we would have to prepare uh, not just some useful tools for them, as you see with the virtual learning comments, which I'll explain in a second, but also some human support for them that, that we get, not just on ground, but also virtually. Uh, we budgeted two online tutors, one for math and one for science, who are embedded into all mathematics courses and science courses that are being taught online. And then they talk with students uh, via chat, or they use the Smart Thinking platform, or they step outside the platform and students give them a call. But what you see here is a screenshot of our virtual learning commons that will go live in the spring. We wanted to create a single hub for academic resources and services so that students would know where to get help, whether it's online or on ground. Uh, we wanted to also establish a learning resources to help students build proficiency with technology, technology and college-wide processes, and, and also to create a location where we could showcase student success stories and testimonials. So as you'll see in the middle of the slide, we have buttons. Students can click on that where they can get help on any of our campuses, uh, which are seven. Uh, we have workshops scheduled for students. They can click on the button and find out when the workshops are being offered and where. We have other resources, such as uh, what Jesse mentioned, the MOOCs. We also have uh, adaptive learning toolkits where students would have to then uh, authenticate to get into our learning management system, and then the writing studio concept, which is a combination of writing and reference in our libraries. Uh, more importantly, you'll see below that the uh, ways of video ways in which students can access smart thinking. Smart thinking does, uh, does exist in my courses. It's in every course that students are enrolled in. Likewise, uh, on their home page, there are a list of additional resources where they can find library help, um, but also burning glasses there so that students who are uh, interested in finding out jobs, job placement, uh, employment opportunities in the area, they can just click on that link and then have an opportunity to uh, experiment a little bit and look around. Next slide, please. So as Jesse uh, mentioned, we do every Wednesday report on a number of metrics that we keep. Uh, my, my team reports on out of class support. This is a typical report. It's from about six weeks ago. You can see that we have tracked students using writing, language arts, science, math, stats, computer help, research help, and smart thinking. Um, for this week, you can see that we had 2,720 student interactions online. It was 308 through Smart Thinking. And, and while this may look a little static to you, Smart Thinking comprises anywhere between 10 and 16 percent of the out-of-class support help that we provide students in these particular areas. And as Krista will mention, those subject areas are 35 in total. They're available for AAAS and baccalaureate degree students. We do not limit the amount of uh, help that they can get as we want to, to continue to monitor that help and push them into places where they can get even more help. And with that, I'll turn it over to Krista from Smart Thinking, who's going to speak a little bit more about tutoring. Great. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, as Joe mentioned, uh, the one-to-one -one, uh, tutorial support is available uh, to students. And in our 16-year history, uh, we've found that this very highly uh, uh, tailored one-to-one -one conferencing support for uh, this population of students, for developmental students or uh, flexible placement students, uh, is very helpful because the student is really met by the tutor at, 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 the, at the point of, of need for them um, and can work in, again, a very highly uh, tailored uh, structured context uh, to um, to work through whatever issues they bring to the table. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've, we've found, though, that in order to engage with students uh, in a meaningful way and in a way that, that promotes learning, not just answer giving from uh, a, a tutor, we found that it's of paramount importance to invest heavily 
in upfront tutor training uh, for the individuals who are going to be working with students, uh, for ongoing professional development uh, for those uh, individuals, so not just training them and setting them off, uh, but uh, uh, having a very, very structured uh, 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 quality control and review program for what tutors are doing, as well as ongoing professional development opportunities. So uh, extensive reviews of actual tutorial archives that occur, and then ongoing feedback to tutors on their important uh, on their performance. And then the third area is really around reinforcing the perspective that tutors are there to support faculty instruction, um, that the faculty uh, are, are the leaders and we are there to support them, um, and also uh, emphasizing with tutors that faculty members do look at the work that they are actually doing with their students. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, the last point um, that, that I would just make on this is that with uh, that faculty buy-in and support for their students utilizing online tutoring, we found that um, uh, students do actually use it with that directive and that blessing from the faculty member, um, and that with consistent use at strategic points during any given course, uh, online tutoring can yield higher grades, greater persistence, and increased retention rates. Uh, and with that, I will hand it back to Joe. Very good. Uh, one of the most important metrics that we uh, track are our success rates. Obviously, at the end of the semester, we're able to look back and see how we did. We also weekly report on the number or the frequency of visits that students uh, that occur in our learning centers. We track one to two, three to four, five to nine, and ten plus. As you'll see to the right, students who come into a learning center ten plus times have an 83% success rate. It's 80% plus across all of our college campuses, and that includes campuses where we struggle the most with populations of students who are um, not well prepared to come into college or who have been out of college for quite a bit of time and need some help. Um, next slide, please. This is a dashboard that we look at. Uh, you might be able to see, but this dates from October 1st, 2014 to September 30th, 2015. This is information and data that we use when we are looking to uh, have on-ground support services, but also to have those online tutors working with students and to make pushes to smart thinking. One thing I didn't mention is that when students come in on a campus to get help, if we are busy, we immediately refer them to smart thinking. We have computer, computers available for them. We help they, them authenticate in. And you can see that, for the most part, we're fairly steady with smart thinking usage between 10 a.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. We consume about six to 7,000 hours uh, yearly, and it's about 4,000 distinct students who get help uh, from smart thinking tutors. And most impressively, students recommend smart thinking to a friend uh, 95%, which is a, a very, very high rate for surveys. Next slide. Uh, we draw down this data as well. We want to know what students are, are, are uh, in need of when they get writing help. When students log in, they indicate, uh, for instance, one of six writing areas that they're looking for help in. You can see Essay Center, Grammar and Documentation Review. And then the essay interest helps us when we know what to provide on ground, but also to give feedback to faculty who have requested their students to use smart thinking. Next slide, please. And then this slide just speaks to the math help. We knew that when we uh, were going to have to make some changes in DevEd that we would get more students using uh, hopefully the math area of smart thinking. This is when they use a white, use the whiteboard technology. But you can see the competencies that students struggle with the most. In algebra, it's solving linear equations, factoring, um, you know, solving rational equations. On the statistics side, it's normal distribution of z-scores, uh, hypothesis tests, one parameter. These are quite common. We see them on ground. But smart thinking gives us the ability to get a lot more granular with regards to competencies that students are struggling with. 
And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jesse. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, I want to take the last couple minutes just really sharing uh, some of the data we have and, and what some of our next steps are as we move forward. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit more data. I'm going to start math and kind of explain what we're looking at here. On the course side, you can see our MAT 1033 and MAT 1100 courses. Those are our, really our, our entering math gateway courses. And then we divide out the rest of the students into our developmental education courses. So they're kind of clumped together. Um, you look at success rates. Again, that's the percentage of A's and C's. Uh, and see the differences there, 54.7 for those gateway courses and 62.8 for the dev ed courses. And then using that su same student group, we kind of dive down and look at those that fit within our flexible placement population, and we're deemed either likely college ready, dev ed recommended, or dev ed strongly recommended. Uh, and you can see, you know, for MAT 1033 and 1100, we had a 60% success rate for those 557 students who we deemed as likely college ready. If we looked at the students that were likely college ready, their dev ed, you can see there's a few students there that weren't comfortable. Even though we said they were likely college ready, uh, they weren't as comfortable going right into gateway class, and, and rightly so. It looks like they had a 40% success rate for those few students. Um, but the most interesting data, I think, in the table is what's highlighted yellow, because that's really the comparison. Those are students that didn't take our recommendations. So you see the ones that went right into Gateway, who we said should be dev ed recommended, they have a 41.7% success rate versus 52%. And then dev ed strongly recommended, 35.6 versus 47.9. But what's most interesting here, and we'll see as we begin to reveal the other tables, is look at the end count. So we had 160 students that didn't take our recommendation that were dev ed strongly recommended, and, and about the other half that did take our recommendation. Look how this number begins to change. So let's pull up um, our reading and writing information. And we can see it even skews more and more the other way. And, and why we believe this is true is it's kind of a, 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 a social uh, uh, stigma element. So we have students that, that it's easy to be in groups of their peers and talk about how you know, they might not be very good at math, uh, but it's much more difficult for them to talk to themselves and have that conversation about how well they read or how well they write. Now, the reality is we're talking about college readiness in both of those. And we know there's a different distinction there. Uh, but nonetheless, look at the differences. So as we move into those other disciplines, it's harder and harder for us to convince students, even with all the information we're providing them, uh, to, to, to make the choice of staying in remedial education. Uh, and at the end of the day, we see the lower success rates, and we just need to figure out a way to help them be successful. Next slide, please. Here's a breakout for all courses, because you know, this legislation is somewhat disruptive. It's not just disruptive for the student who's gateway that jumps in, who's developmental, who jumps in the gateway courses, but it's also disruptive somewhat for the students that surround them, who maybe rightly so are college ready in that classroom. Uh, and look at some of the startling difference. So we broke the two populations of students flex placement into those that took our recommendations and those that didn't take our recommendations. And you can see for overall there, the difference between the success rates for all courses is about 15.2%. Um, but as we start to move down the chart, uh, what we notice is some of our students that have the greatest need uh, when it comes to college readiness are black African American male students and our Hispanic Latino male students have much greater differences between those success rates. Uh, for black African American students, males, it's 18.1%. Uh, for Hispanic males, it jumps up to 20% difference. Uh, so some of the populations that we've Work with the hardest, and to be honest, with the college experience in 2011, we've had the greatest gains. Uh, some of that's been negated uh, as a result of the implementation of, of um, the dev ed reform at our institution. Uh, next slide, please. So we need to figure out how to, how, to, how to improve the numbers that you just saw. We're working real hard to be able to do that. Uh, here's five things that we're doing in terms of the next steps. Uh, we talked about the college experience. Uh, and how we've been doing the, the front end orientation, and that's really had been focused historically on students that had tested into remediation because they, we knew they had a greater need. Uh, with part of this implementation and the understanding that we had good results even with those students after performing some of their peer groups as a result of the intervention, uh, this beginning of this fall, we ramped up to what we call smart start orientation. So instead of a single hour and a half orientation, we now include that and then additionally have of blended sessions that are an hour and a half in class, hour and a half out of class, the first four weeks of school. Uh, it's free for students. There's no charge, and they're actually taught by our advisors and teach them about the support structure that exists around them at St. Petersburg College. 
Uh, we're working more to improve identification of these students and communication with these students. So we're doing more to work with our faculty and our deans uh, to be able to identify these students, draw them out in groups, and do more to help intervene and help them. Uh, we want to do more with co-requisites. We've had some really good success uh, with the co-requisite classes that go with our ENC 1101 or our Comp 1 class. Uh, same instructor, more time on task for students. Uh, and we've really helped in some of the areas they've struggled with, like inference. Uh, so we want to expand and talk about how to work that in the mathematics realm as well. Uh, we want to create course milestones, because what we're noticing uh, is while we've always had uh, milestones that exist for communications, you have to have comp one in your first 12 hours, you have to have comp two in your first 24 hours. We never had structure in place that existed for mathematics. Um, this has really become a more pronounced problem as students aren't, don't even have to be college ready in mathematics, and that contributes to specific prerequisites, the skills they may need as they go forward. So we've got to put some policy changes in place. And lastly is working with our local school district. Uh, we received a small grant to kind of begin that work, uh, but we've worked closely. We're fortunate we just have a single uh, school district that we work with, um, but really working very closely with them to understand the alignment that exists in competencies between high schools and college, and even to the point of working with faculty across uh, faculty in, at the college and faculty in the high school and having conversations about prerequisite competencies, co-requisite competencies, uh, and even the language sometimes mm -hmm. and making sure we're, we're talking about the same thing and the student understands the language the same way. Um, so that, 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 that's really uh, kind of in the nutshell a lot of the work that we've done in, in this particular area is as we've responded to the legislation as quick as we can and done the most we can to help our students be successful and continue to do so. Great. Well, thank you, Jesse and Joe and Krista. That was uh, very informative. Uh, so we will now uh, open it up for question and answer. Uh, just as a reminder, please do use the uh, question pane and type in your uh, question or comments, and I'll um, moderate them as we go along. Um, so one of the questions that we've received already um, for you, Jesse and Joe, is are you, is your faculty unionized, and was there any resistance to these changes? No, our faculty is not unionized, uh, and I think that the answer to the second part is we, um, as Jesse had referenced, we began with a pretty extensive training program for faculty. Uh, we have a very good relationship up and down the line with deans, provosts, department chairs, uh, faculty senate, CETL, that's our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, and everybody was, was primarily on board from the start, from the get-go. Yeah, we clearly made this an institutional priority, mm -hmm. and I think as evidenced by the video, we'll send out the link of our student, two, uh, senior vice presidents really hand-in-hand -hand having that conversation with the college family, but we made, made this a high-level initiative from day one. Uh, in our value structure, our culture structure, it's very important that we work together and collaborate. So, you know, it really was, we realized this was important, we realized this was going to impact a lot of students, uh, and we all had to join in and roll up our sleeves and, and make it work, and, and faculty were an integral part of that discussion. Likewise, they're an integral part of what we're doing going forward to help improve some of our numbers. Yeah, and let, let me just add a little bit onto that. I mean, they were very important, faculty cooperation uh, was very important for building the MOOCs, the toolkits that we've got, many of the resources. My tutors work in those departments along with the discipline that they, that they tutor students in. So there was a good bit of synergy built around finding the best resources for students. Great, thank you. And there was a clarifying question. Are there MOOC trainings for tutor training? We do have that. It's interesting You someone asks that. We actually have online modules for tutors. When we hire new tutors, whether they're budgeted or OPS or even students or federal work study, we onboard them through a series of modules that we have uh, that we created some time ago. And we update them as we've been making changes uh, annually. That's a good question. And, and if I could just tack on to that, that first question we had, I think an important aspect of this we didn't spend a lot of time organizationally worrying about whether the legislation was good or bad. Right. You know, the reality was the legislation was the legislation and it passed. It wasn't going anywhere. And if we didn't do anything, it was going to have a strong negative impact on our students. Um, so, you know, that underlying value system really helped us 
define the decision that we had to move forward and we had to react quickly if we were going to help our students be successful. Great. And um, as a college, have you conducted any interventions at the high school level? We, we, we're, we're moving down that path is the best way to explain. We have something we call here at, at, at uh, St. Petersburg College. Um, we're helping develop what we call ecosystems, educational ecosystems, uh, and they consist of partnerships. Uh, even though we cover a, a, a district or a county, uh, we've broken that down into small parts and are working directly with principals in high, in high schools along with their feeder middle schools and elementary schools along with the college in that, in that particular area, that college campus. And we're working together collaboratively to improve education. Uh, and we've been doing this for about three years, so the articulation piece has always been an important part, articulating from elementary to middle to high to college. Um, but this is a natural fit. So as this came up, we began to have address those conversations and talking about the articulation that exists between high school and college and how we can improve that pipeline for students. And the early enrollment. Yeah. Dual enrollment. Dual early enrollment. College, early really college. Yeah. Play. Yeah. Big partners. Thank you. And um, we have time for uh, one more, one last question. Um, how did your you address the faculty concerns with smart thinking tutors being very unfamiliar or um, wondering if they were uh, qualifiable. And Krista, I'm hoping that you can join in too and explain just a little bit more about the tutors and how you screen and train them. Why don't you go first, Krista? Uh, sure. So um, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, invest um, a tremendous amount of time up front um, in the uh, screening and recruitment of tutors. Um, all uh, applicants need to submit um, extensive uh, resume and experience uh, and history overview and then we have um, all of our applicants go through uh, a series of online screening simulations that essentially test their content knowledge but also uh, test um, uh, how they would uh, uh, conduct an online tutoring session in the online environment so we look very carefully for uh, uh, applicants not giving direct answers but for really supporting and scaffolding that student learning. Uh, once uh, a, an applicant passes that initial uh, screening, we have everybody go through a 10 to 15 hour online training program that orients them to the technology, but also more importantly, really them to tutoring in an online environment, how to engage the student uh, and account for those affective dimensions in a synchronous or, as or asynchronous exchange. Um, also, while following a pedagogy that uh, complements the institution um, and, and again puts that faculty member at the center. Um, once that training is complete, uh, a tutor is then on our quote-unquote live queue where they're working with students. Um, and then as I mentioned before, every single interaction between a student and a tutor is saved and archived, whether it occurs in a synchronous or asynchronous venue. And my management team uh, has a regular system of reviewing those archives. Uh, um, following up with, with tutors if there are any concerns or if there are uh, um, areas where a tutor is really excelling. Um, we have formal uh, uh, performance reviews every term and then we also have obviously customer support where if we get any complaints from tutors or faculty members we immediately follow up uh, with, um, with those issues. Uh, and then we also have student surveys which um, we monitor very closely. Uh, student surveys can provide some interesting data. Some students would will we'll mark a tutor uh, uh, with a low uh, uh, numerical score because the tutor didn't give them the answer. And so we kind of put some of those scores in context. But that is another way where we can see trends and patterns uh, of how tutors are performing based on actual student feedback. And so with all of those uh, measures put in place, uh, that's, that, that's a key way that, again, we make sure that tutors are doing and, 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 and working with students in the way that, that, that we want them to. 
Um, and then also, as I said before, we really do encourage faculty members at the institution to either have their students print out their archives and submit them with completed work, or actually go in and, and, and review archives, the archives themselves. Uh, there can be some interesting uh, uh, information about trends of patterns and trouble areas that if a student consider if students across a cohort consistently are asking the same types of questions in algebra or or are consistently coming with the same types of questions uh, with a, um, a comp course or a science course uh, that can be a helpful flag for a professor to say well you know maybe it would be good if I spend another another class going over X um, so all of those ways combined is, 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 I think, helpful to alleviate very justified faculty concerns about their students working, you know, with, with tutors who the faculty members have not individually blessed. Well, thank you. Um, just, that's all. Did you need Go ahead. Me? No, on the faculty side, I would just say we have a long, a long relationship with smart thinking and, you know, faculty have become very comfortable uh, referring students to that, as Krista mentioned, when students do have a, uh, a smart thinking paper, they can bring it to the faculty member and say, this is what I've done already now. Let's begin this as part of the drafting process. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you to our panelists. We do, um, we're out of time for questions, but here's their contact information, and uh, we will be sharing the recording of this webinar as well as supplemental resources with all attendees today, uh, including the contact information for any follow-up. And we are taking a break for the holidays, um, for winter break, uh, with the Technology Solutions webinar series, but we'll be back on Wednesday, January 20th, 2016 in the new year um, at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, so please stay tuned for details on that broadcast. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for attending today, and uh, we look forward to having you join us again in January.